Hello, dear viewers. This is Kenito from Tokyo. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss uh, on the, one of the most important uh, recent topics in AI ethics, that is algorithmic bias. I hope my talk will be a little bit beyond your expectations. Here we go. What does algorithmic bias mean today? This means social unfairness and inequality produced by AI. Timnit Gebru, a computer scientist, one of the leading researchers in this field, born in Ethiopia, and after studying at Stanford, she has worked on algorithmic bias, especially focusing on race and gender at Google. On 2020, she published a paper which showed the possible errors in a large-scale natural language AI system, the issues of energy consumption, for the machine learning caused by the system and the issues of environmental burdens it possibly brings. Over her publication, she eventually left from Google and it became a scandal. But this is not the main interest of my talk today. My main interest lies in the fundamentals of AI ethics. Then, again, what is algorithmic bias? Briefly speaking, the answer is AI would have prejudice. In human society, there exist various kinds of discrimination, hate, and wrong recognition. These social biases were embedded in AI as the forms of dataset, and AI itself imitates social bias and then starts to think with prejudice. This is called algorithmic bias. Such a potential problem had been pointed out already in the year 2012. Generally speaking, however, it's safe to say that it was at the Asiloma Conference on Artificial Intelligence in January 2017 that the AI problem of bias was widely recognized, noticed, and after that, the problem in question has become widely known all over the world. Here is an example of the AI bias problem I'm talking about. Suppose that there is a data set which shows the high rate of crime by social minority, for example, black people. An AI system which learns uh, such a bias data set might show as its result a certain high potential rate of crime by black people. It's also well known that the facial distinction rate of the white male is much higher than that of black female people. I argue that unbalanced data will eventually give rise to this biased system, which was produced by insufficient quality and amount of data and the statistics. When such two slips meet at once, what will be happen? Let's suppose that a crime has occurred in some area. If AI led a conclusion of a potential suspect with much racial prejudice, moreover, if the potential suspect were specified by the AI facial system, which has its low distinction image recognition, what will be happened? False churches would be systematically made again and again based on such a biased AI crime analysis. This is a typical AI ethical problem of algorithmic bias. Most people easily think that an AI solution is worth trusting. But in reality, possibly, various fatal errors I'm talking about here are systematically produced by racial prejudice inherently kept in the actual society and the low standard of maintaining database. And Timnit Gebel was one of the researchers who pointed out this problem, elucidated its mechanism and considered the possible solution for the problem. Her study in her research called Gender Shades showed a big difference between the precision of AI facial distinction of Caucasian male and that of black female. Also, she wrote her article under the category of Race and Gender in Oxford Handbook of AI Ethics 2020. This problem is called algorithmic bias, but the starting point of the problem lies in a data set which includes prejudices. However, the present AI can distinguish the data issue from the algorithm issue 
And for this reason, this particular problem is not so easy to be solved. TeamNIT emphasizes the importance of preserving the original data which gave rise to the algorithm and keeping it under the condition that re-examinations are possible. AI shouldn't copy or reproduce unconscious prejudice, discrimination and hate which lie in the societies we live in. Also, if distorted information were sent to our society with specific interests, our understanding would be influenced by that distorted information. For an example of this, the propaganda of Nazis German from 1933 to 45 is the worst ruinous example in the whole human history. Similarly, if big data, which reflect a specific interest, were taken in AI algorithm, the society would be manipulated with the abuse of AI calculation, AI calculation between quotation, as its result. How then can we prevent and overcome such an algorithmic error? Today, I'd like to propose a possible scenario of solutions for this difficult problem from the far eastern island country Japan. One of the key ideas I'd like to discuss can be found in Japanese Zen Buddhism, by which Steve Jobs got fascinated. Steve Jobs passed away in the year 2011 at the age of 56. So he knew neither Google Cat in 2012, nor the third wave AI boom after that. But if Steve were alive today during the pandemic of COVID-19, what kind of business and what kind of AI ethics would he be working on and promoting? There is a book titled Zen in the Art of Archery, which Steve Jobs loved to read throughout his life. Written in 1936 by a German philosopher, Eugen Herregel born in 1884 and passed away in 1955. Originally in German, the Richterliche Kunst der Bogenschließens von Eugen Rohriger. This book explores the interaction between Japanese archery and the Japanese Zen praxis. During the 1920s, Dr. Hergel, who taught German idealism philosophy in a Japanese university, namely Tohoku Imperial University, learned ancient Japanese archery, or Kyudo, not Judo, but Kyudo, with a grandmaster Kenzo Awa, Awa Kenzo. The word Kyudo literally means uh, the way of archery. From the standpoint of European rational swords, archery is originally used as a weapon which hits its target, and now it has become one of the popular sports. But in Japan, still until the end of the 20th century, Zen priests practiced shooting a bow at the means of prayer. Prayer. For Japanese people, archery has been regarded as something quite spiritual. In this regard, let me briefly talk about Zen and Buddhism. But in order to do this, here I'd like to introduce Dr. Reverend Masaki Matsubara. He's a Zen priest and also he's working as Cornell University, Brown University, and also our University of Tokyo as a visiting professor. Furthermore, he was served as a mindfulness mentor at Google, the company, who also introduced the g -Pose stress reduction system there. Life is suffering. We are living in a tough daily life. Our life is tough. That is a Buddhist idea to think about. In other words, how it is possible to understand life with Dukkha. That is the, the core idea of in Buddhism. For example, Buddhism gives us a solution. The solution is called concept of four noble truths. Four noble truths. One is obviously there is suffering. Second, that suffering 
has a cause. Third, there is a liberation from the suffering that is called nirvana. Number four, which is last, is that there is a way to achieve the liberation, nirvana. Look at an image of Requiem shot by a priest. This archery place was established in the year 1977 by Reverend Kohun Suhara, the abbot of Keisho An Temple, located as one of the subtemples of the main temple called Engakuji in Kamakura. By the way, Engakuji Temple is the place where Dr. Matsuburo was born. The bow Dr. Herigel used is now stored in this archery place at Engakuji. The great master Awa taught to Dr. Herigel, in the context of Japanese archery, shooting a bow not in technique, but in spirit. In other words, the great master taught to the doctor, don't think and don't aim the target. But why does Japanese archery teach not to think and not aim at the target. Why does Japanese archery teach not to think and not to aim at the target? To have a better understanding of this seemingly paradoxical statement, let's listen to the lecture by Reverend Dr. Matsuburo again. This is a glass of water, and then I put the dirt into it. Important thing is that this glass of water represents our mind. Now, I stir this glass of water. Now, it is impossible to identify what the contents are. Again, this glass of water symbolizes our mind, the state of our mind. Exactly, we don't know we are always wondering who we are, who we really are. So Zen tradition tells us how it is possible to clarify what the contents are. The tradition's answer is just to place this glass of water on a flat place and then just wait be patient. That is a tradition's answer to that question. After seconds, after minutes, we are getting to know what the contents are. The heavier things going down, lighter things going up, water is getting clearer. Let's say there are two stages of meditation. To place this cup of water on the floor, then everything calm down. That is the first stage, first phase of meditation. The second stage of meditation is the situation we can find something new. The something new I couldn't recognize when I had picked up the dirt before putting into this cup of water. Oh, I didn't recognize small bag here. I didn't recognize I picked up accidentally a piece of moss 
or leaves to find something new that is the second phase of meditation. But please remember the meaning of Zen. The meaning of the Zen is simply to place this cup of water on a flat place. That simple action is Zen itself. Buddhism, including Zen, teaches the importance of the way to see a thing as it is, trying to avoid any prejudice. This practice is called right mindfulness. According to Zen Buddhism, when you shoot a bow, the very process of thinking of the target or aiming at them is regarded as an unnecessary superfluous noise, that's to say, an obstacle in an attempt of the right mindfulness. What we learn from the Japanese Kudo archery is actually completely different from Western rational thinking. Why does Zen address uh, that an archer shouldn't aim at the target at a glance? It's seemingly irrational idea, but actually it has also a rational background. Ancient Japanese archery is simple and light in the structure. It doesn't have its complicated structure like a Western rifle or crossbow gun. This means that for a Japanese archer, extreme concentration and relaxation of body mind are required. During thinking, human body subconsciously get tense, and thus it gets too hard. And this mental and physical conditions causes fluctuations in many places of the body. When the somatic fluctuation is smaller than the error range of the shot, a bow would shoot the mark, so an archer shouldn't feel, uh, think, or aim, but simply look at the target and let the bow go. This idea has its core essentials directly connected to the principles of AI computation, a convolutional neural network, CNN, or Bayesian statistics, though I won't discuss further in this talk now. Related to this idea of no thinking, an ancient Japanese archery teaches another different meaning, that is, an oracle, or a fortune telling. Ancient Japanese people thought that, while having even no instant moment of thought, an archer simply draws a bow and the arrow goes after the god's will. There is a good example that is a widely known story of folding fun target in the tale of Heike. This story is based on a historical battle occurred in the year 1185 between the Heike samurai clan and the Genji samurai clan. Uh, this battle is called uh, the Naval Battle of Iyashima. Uh, this story shows Nasuno Yoichi, a young archery expert of the Genji, did hit the fun mark set uh, on a boat floating in the sea. The mark was set up by the Heike clan who prepared it as an oracle to the god of war. His shooting technique was so wonderful that even the opponent Heike samurais cheered for it. One warrior of Heike began to dance on the board. Then, the general commander of the Genji clan, Minamoto no Yoshitsune, ordered Yoichi to shoot the dancing warrior. All of a sudden, the warrior was killed by Yoichi's arrow, and everybody became quiet. Then, the battle had begun again. For his order to shoot the dancing warrior, Yoshitsune's ruthless character was criticized even by the allies. Finally, Yoshitsune was forced to commit suicide in the northern end of Japan with the age of 30. Once ordered, Japanese warrior archer hits the target without any thinking. In this context, we can argue that in the spirit of archery in the Bushido, that is the way of warrior, is quite similar to AI or machine learning system, without any thinking and any hesitation. If we think that a living sniper shoots a living human as his or her target, we would easily see a variety of hesitation and psychological disturbance. But under AI system, in fact, 
a military drone would shoot the target without any thinking and any hesitation. Last three. AI ethical problems related to the laser weapon is very important, so I'd like to leave it、uh, for another occasion. This photo shows a stage series of performance entitled Ocean by the New York m a r s h c a n n g h a m Dance Company. This is a post humorous work of the music director of the company, John Cage, a collaborator and old friend. This photo shows a stage series of a performance entitled Ocean by the New York m a r s h c a n n g h a m Dance Company. This is a post humorous work of the music director of the company, John Cage, a collaborator and old friend. You can see instrumental players, 118 musicians sitting in a circle surrounding the dancing stage and the audience. I serve as an orchestra director in the first performance of this Ocean. I've been working as a composer, as an orchestra opera conductor for the last 35 years. My current laboratory started in the year 1999. Since then, concurrent with my own music activities, my lab has focused on the ethics of media and information、uh, based on the both、uh, natural and the social sciences and humanities. By the way, this lecture is for the New York University, g o f l a v and supported by m u n i c h Technical University and the University of Tokyo. And 31 years ago, I should study orchestra conducting under Leonard Bernstein in the same New York City. But all of a sudden, Maestro Lenny had passed away, and finally, finally, I stayed in Tokyo, continued PhD candidate studies in physics, got music prizes. With the judgment of only d u t i u g i o r g i Ligeti, Luciano b e r i o and worked、uh, internationally as composer and conductor simultaneously. Then a new wind blew in the year 1995, meeting with a French composer conductor, Pierre Boulez. I applied methods of physics to solve classical problems of music, most of which was proposed by Arnold s c h e m b e r g the composer, music theorist. And they're reformulated by Olivier Mission, p i e r b u l e s himself, Luigi Nono, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, and many other musicians. Then I got a PhD and appointed a professor of composition and conducting at the University of Tokyo in the year 1999. My collaboration with the New York m e r s h c a n n i n g h a m Dance Company, John Cage's posthumous work Ocean, was also during that period. After that, I had organized conducting method with P.L. b u l l i s on which I'd explain soon. I also collaborated with the Bayreuth of Spielhaus, conducted music dramas of Richard Wagner, just following the original stage setting and the motion captions, which have the most important three dimensional characteristics, and evaluated the space time physio cognitive acoustics by use of interferometric correlation analysis. I prepared, on which I'd also explain soon. During the 1930s and 40s,、uh, Wagner's music and the Bayreuth had used for the propaganda of Nazi Germany. Then, after the Second World War, the most severe ethical reflection was demanded, and they had a direct relationship with the current AI ethical problematics. My first collaboration with the Munich Technical University was on the ethics of public propaganda and media mind control. My best friend Christoph Lütke has proposed an important philosophical concept, das Notungprinzip, the Notung Principle, based on the Richard Wagner's work, The Name of the Sacred Thought, Notung, 
in the music drama The Ring of the Nibelung. Thus our research lab had focused on the fundamental study of music, expression and their ethics, in parallel with a practical music making, and also with a background of physical and information sciences, ethical study of highly organized autonomous system, self-driving car, and ethics of AIs from the common deep root. You may wonder what kind of relationship is there between Nazi Holocaust and uh, AI ethics, but indeed, you'll see, there are a vast amount of fundamental links between those two and more. On April 2021, an Irish digital artist is condemned severely by putting colors and even a smile on the Cambodian victims of Khmer Rouge. This is from the artist's homepage. With contemporary AI technology, such minor changes are quite easy and there is no technical, no technical problems. Where there are innumerable numbers of ethical problems around such AI faking of personal faces, voices or actions artificially added against his, her or their believed families, relatives or friends will. This is also from the artist's homepage. Colored Death Mask of Ludwig van Beethoven. How do you feel about this? Shall Ludwig open his eyes with the aid of AI image processing? It's not at all easy to obtain a simple answer, but it's technically very, very, very easy to manipulate documents in such manner. To any death mask, and if any dead face or dead body. Then, how about the victims of the Holocaust? lost their lives in the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Once again, how do you think ethically to put colors, emotions, or even smiles to any historical documents, or the facts, like this famous photo? Such manipulation is called a deep fake, and deep faking on individual face, personal voice, action, and any other document should be ethically throughout strictly discussed and operated. But indeed, until now, we, the human beings have no high round table of morality to deal with such problem. The Global AI Ethics Consortium should play a proper role for the common benefit and future of all the human beings and our digitalized world. Now, let's go back to focus on the viewpoint of the 20th century American artist John Cage was also deeply influenced by Zen Buddhism. John's idea of uncertainty means chance, with little intention of a particular individual. Similar to the case of Steve Jobs, John Cage was influenced by the Zen thoughts introduced by a Japanese Zen philosopher Daisetsu Suzuki from 1870 to 1966. In John's well-known piano piece, 4 minutes 33 seconds, a pianist is just sitting in front of his piano without playing the keyboards, and he simply listens to the silence in the concert hall. The point of this piece is that if the pianist's arbitrariness is made least or made a zero, to what would we listen? This is a simple application of Zen Buddhism's right mindfulness in the Eightfold Ways to Music Listening. And the idea of 4 minutes 33 seconds means 273 seconds. And this number of 273 is based on the idea of thermodynamic absolute zero, which is minus uh, 273 degrees Celsius. Jean always liked uh, joking and uh, this article shows an example of it. While being called uh, with the same word uncertainty, when Heisenberg's idea of uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics is totally different from John's uncertainty. Quantum mechanical uncertainty principle tells when measuring the velocity of a wave, the location can be specified to a certain point. And when specifying the location of the wave, velocity of the wave can be measured clearly. As Heisenberg's inequality doesn't contain temperature T, this also explains a fluctuation of the wave function at the absolute zero degree. Jones' chance and Heisenberg's uncertainty is completely different still thinking of the AI problems. 
I noticed that uh, these two indeterminacies are strangely related at some zero degree point. While Cage's chance means avoidance of subjective arbitrariness, Heisenberg only tells the mathematical relation of physical phenomena. But in AI, even subjective prejudice or erratum would form a dataset, and its algorithmic structure is calculated. Even a subjective arbitrariness is recorded as physically fixed dataset. Here, I'd like to put a name of researcher in the field of mathematical probability, Andrei Kolmogorov. The fundamental problems of AI always fluctuate between objective mathematical structure and subjective preference or prejudice. In the latter part of this talk, I'd like to think over the zero degree of prejudice once again. Now I want to introduce another musician who thinks this problem is free will and uncertainty theory with me. He's a French composer conductor, Pierre Boulez. Pierre Boulez and I developed a method of conducting with that figure together, which is known as spectral conducting. When we met for the first time in 1995, as a musician who had also studied mathematics, Boulez was hoping to remove any unnecessary arbitrary gesture of conducting. Nine years later, after an experience of a medical autopsy and the application of digital markless motion capture system, I noticed simple principle of corporal technique and uh, we synthesized so-called angular dynamical method of conducting with any ambiguous figures. Unfortunately, Pierre passed away in uh, 2016. After his passing, I was invited to his ILCAM, French National Institute for the Research and Coordination in Acoustic Music, which Boulez has established, and I gave my lecture on the Angular Dynamics, which we too established together. Thereafter, Kazuki Otsuka, uh, Mitsuharu Ishikawa, and I applied the machine language system to motion data Pierre Boulez had left, and we extracted tangibly the rhythm and the articulation Pierre considered in his mind during the performance posthumously. With appropriate motion data left even after his lifetime, AI can extract historical master's musical mind and even unconsciousness during the performance. And of course, the similar analysis is applicable to living musicians, not only the conductors, but also the instrumental players. AI yeah, can even extract one's unconscious habit in a performing, and it can objectify such an unconscious habit as physical motion data. We can apply this ability to improve performing style, as well as to invent a new technique of rendering, for example, to play incredibly fast or extremely correct, and even to prevent potential diseases. Moreover, this practice is also deeply related to physical and mental realization of the prayers, with the most careful listening. And the practice is almost the same with the right mindfulness in Zen Buddhism, relaxation, careful listening to the world, and a simple and a correct performance. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our Tokyo Orchestra Mozart prayers, rehearsals, and performances also have a meaning of music Zen practice, even for the mental health and the stress reduction of the young musicians. <laughs> 